From September 28th, 2019 until February 10th, 2020, I ran an almost weekly tabletop campaign for three other people. It was my first time being a game master. We didn't meet up in person for this. Rather, we did it online. In fact, the setup that you can see here is exactly where I was and what I was doing when I ran games. In total, the adventure lasted 52 hours and 25 minutes split over 17 individual games. What started as an investigation into the shooting of a mayoral candidate ended up transforming into a web conspiracy that broke my brain. Startling revelations destroyed the relationships of the characters and the players in charge of them. We escalated from low-level thugs to mutants and supervillains, and this campaign has created moments that, for better or worse, will stick for some time. Over a 10-day course the adventure took place, 46 murders were committed by a single character. Another player was shot to death. Two NPCs were committed to fates worse than death. Also, they figured Bruce Wayne was Batman. I have come out of the other side relatively unscathed, but definitely changed. In September 2019, I was a small green baby with an eye patch. In 2020, I'm a very real and very tired man. How did that happen? More importantly, how can you learn from my successes and failures? I'm James. I used to be Gamesty. Now I'm Hot Cider. The reason for running my own campaign was simply because I had wanted to for a while. I had already played a few campaigns and I wanted to step into the shoes of the Game Master. It would also be an opportunity to develop core skills like improvisation, problem solving and managing a long term project. So where did we start? The initial pitch for the adventure was this. Detectives in Gotham City. No Batman. I picked this idea for a very simple reason. I like Batman and the world he occupies. The setting has almost 80 years of rich detail to pilfer from and could be flexible for our needs. I pitched it to the group on the basis that it was fantastic enough for the tone that we usually played in, but would take a more grounded approach we were yearning for. The no Batman rule was key, however. They knew up front that this would be a detective game, so having the world's greatest detective in this setting would be a little bit demoralising. Taking him out of the setting was woven into our unique fiction and became a smaller mystery to solve. Initially, I had imagined that this would be a game set in the GCPD with each character an officer. Instead, at the player's request, we went with private detectives. At that moment, the idea was formalised. The Gotham Knights Detective Agency. The final piece to get the ball rolling was a system. We had been used to playing previous campaigns and systems built on the Powered by Apocalypse engine. It's the backbone of titles like Dungeon World, Monster of the Week and Apocalypse World. On our first campaign we chose Dungeon World for its player friendliness and flexibility. Afterwards we kept with it for familiarity. For this game I stood with a PBTA system for that very reason. We wound up using the PBTA system Spirit of 77 to power Gotham Knights. It was partially built for investigation and also brought something to the fold that I didn't really consider. It set time period and tone. I initially thought of an 80s TV procedural for the aesthetic and so bumping the dial back three years actually worked for what I had wanted. The players were in charge of their characters. With their input, I would come up with the rest. The world characters and the challenges they may face. There were two requests made by the players at this initial concept stage. They wanted problems initially grounded with slow escalation. They wanted the Riddler. The latter was purely as fan service. The former made sense. You go too big out the gate and there's nowhere else to go. Plus it fit that player's want for a Batman setting more in line with the interpretation that they liked from the Nolan films. I threw on a few more restrictions for myself to create more interesting situations. My goal was to give them a reason to come back every game and work towards unravelling the big mystery. So the pitch was this. 
The setting was a Gotham City that was grounded, the little camp, with a mix of organised crime and costume criminals in operation. There'd be no superpowers. Instead, science weapons would be a rare supernatural threat. The year was 1977, at the height of unemployment, sanitary concerns and crime in the city. With the GCPD too overwhelmed and no Batman in sight, be up to the recently established Gotham Knights Detective Agency to solve problems. They were a Vietnam veteran, a retired police officer, and the so-called descendant of Sherlock Holmes. They bend the rules, but never break, unless they wanted to face severe consequences. On September 28, 2019, Gotham Knights had its first game that lasted approximately 3 hours and 42 minutes. In it, we met the characters, learned their initial motivations, and saw them solve their first mystery. The game ended on a cliffhanger for the larger mystery that would move the rest of the campaign. The shooting of mayoral candidate Bruce Wayne. On February 10th, 2020, we played the epilogue of Gotham Knights. As well as concluding the stories of our player characters and set up potential threads, we took an hour to go through campaign feedback. One player gave their feedback on a form link below. The other two were there to talk through my performance. It was headlined by three big questions. Overall, were you satisfied with the campaign? Would you play with James as a GM again? And would you play another campaign in this setting? The answer to all three was a resounding yes. However, there was a little more nuance to all of them which would be the basis of lessons learned. How honest did we stay on that initial pitch? By the campaign's end, Gotham City was still grounded but a little camp. But it had also been partially levelled during a blackout that saw millions of dollars in damages and nearly a hundred citizens dead. Much of the organised crime and costume criminals had been wiped out single-handedly by a spree killer over the course of a single week. The GCPD would be massively restructured, and Batman did return. The Gotham Knights Detective Agency disbanded, with one of their members dead, Another retired with a missing leg and ruined hand. Another going underground to avoid surveillance. And the last becoming a new Batman. They had solved the shooting of Bruce Wayne. They knew the person responsible and the motivations for why it happened. They'd even figured out the identity of the Batman. More importantly, they revealed the instigator of the entire campaign, discovered the motivations, why, and finally brought them to justice. In short, things escalated. They also got to meet the Riddler. The recorded campaign time, including setup and end of game, was exactly 59 hours, 13 minutes and 3 seconds. To put it another way, you could watch the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy almost five times in the duration it took us to play the campaign from beginning to end. The campaign had eight planned episodes. They were cold open, bullet points, thunder and lightning, speeding bullets, crop Phobia, Shapeshifters, Bullet Train, Blackout. In reality, the game actually played out over the course of 17 individual games that took place between the 28th of the 9th, 19, to the 10th of the 2nd, 20. In other words, 135 days between beginning to end. Just over 19 weeks. Around the time you'd reach your second trimester. Beginning with episode 2, each plan episode grew in time to completion. It culminated with episode 5. For reference, 1 was a single game that lasted 3 hours, 42 minutes and 29 seconds. Episode 5 was 3 whole games that combined lasted 10 hours, 38 minutes and 53 seconds. After episode 5, they did reduce in length and became usually 2 game affairs. And on average, each game worked out to around 4 hours. On the longer end of a standard role playing game. Because the game was as long as it was, and such a conspiracy lady mystery, I ended up having to actually create a document for the players to keep track of what had happened. That document is linked below. The easiest answer would be, as a new GM, I ran games a little slower and more carefully. Also as a first time GM, I wanted to throw everything in the pot. But that's not exactly true. In reality, the game became a lot more dense as it went along. 
Unbelievably, this adventure took place between Monday, September 19th, 1977, and the early hours of Wednesday, September 28th, 1977. The first four days took place over the course of six games, the last 11 over the course of only three. In particular, two planned episodes and what became five games took place in world over the course of a single day. It started at 9am and continued through till just after midnight, around 15 hours. Funnily enough, the combined playtime of all five games also worked out to 15 hours and 43 minutes. First lesson learned. There's an exact moment in the campaign where time grew exponentially, and it was the introduction of Lei Fu, the new character played by Theodore Holmes's player. Following Theodore's death in Metropolis, we came up with Lei between sessions to keep this player in the campaign. Maybe a little contrived, but we had even built some pre-established lore for why he'd be there. His father was the landlord of the office the Gotham Knights rented out of, and he was keen on seeing justice served outside of the GCPD's involvement like they were. The death of Theodore had a knock-on effect in a few other ways. For one, it was a continuing lesson to be learnt in how lethal to be, with one of the characters nearly impossible to harm, raising the stakes ended up putting the other two characters in danger. It also changed a lot of the idea's plan moving forward. In the fiction, it kicked two of the surviving players off the Bruce Wayne investigation. But the biggest knock-on was time. From episode 1, we played around 19 hours and 37 minutes of the adventure with Theo Holmes. From episode 5, we played 38 hours and 3 minutes with Lei Fu. Almost double the amount of time. So how did that happen? He was ideologically opposed to both Frank Gibbs and Kane Cole. He didn't believe in lawful process, but he also didn't agree with violent vigilantism. Frank and Kane had split over the death of Theodore Holmes, in particular the action of Frank stopping Kane from killing Deadshot so she could be properly tried. On game 8, the three began to do their own thing, and as a GM it took until game 11 to realise I had let this happen. It continued this way until game 13, and this kind of coincided with Episode 7, The Bullet Train. Here, they were forced by the Riddler on a train of terror together as the Gotham Knights, whether they liked it or not. After that, they kind of went back to doing their own thing until end of game. This often did work within the schedules of the players, though. They would often dip out for maybe 20 to 40 minutes at a time for personal reasons, but rather pause for the other players, we could pick up with them. One player would even finish the character's tasks and leave the game as the other two resolve their problems. It created a bit of a strange dynamic, especially at the end moment where a fight scene that maybe could have been done with an extra hour to breathe was cut short due to scheduling. It was very dramatic though. If you're willing to put characters who hate each other together, you get really good role-playing. And my favourite moments of this campaign was just listening to them bicker without my involvement. And this came to a head during game 13. So this was designed to be a recap of the adventure before the finale. A radio broadcast went out over Gotham, where the Riddler had announced that he had loaded a train with explosives and hostages, and it was up to the knights to stop it. What waited for them on board was an obstacle course, with each carriage themed after an episode. The third carriage was based on their investigation into the villain Maximilian Zeus, a business mogul with delusions of grandeur that killed one of his own employees. On the train, Zeus had been kidnapped from Blackgate Prison and bound to an electric chair. The knights had two options, leave him to fry, or save his life. The Vietnam veteran Kane Cole decided to make his own third option, speed up proceedings by pulling out a gun and blasting Zeus in the chest. Lei Fu attempted yet failed to stop him doing so. Ultimately, he failed to save Zeus as he died on that train. What was the lesson learnt here? Well, for one thing, putting characters in situations where sparks fly is great, but more importantly, keeping a party together doesn't mean everyone has to get along, even if holding hands and being nice would be fantastic. But for the sake of saving time, you should consider giving them a singular objective to achieve. Those eight episodes were somewhat planned beforehand, but not at all in detail. Rather, it was vague prompts of, in this episode they're going to investigate Mr. Freeze, or in this episode they'll need to investigate man-bat experiments. What happened in between was what I ended up calling 80-20 planning. 
In the week between game zero planning and one, I sat down and mapped where the campaign would go. Because this was an investigation game, the mysteries they faced needed to have known endpoints. The main story would begin with the mystery of the Bruce Wayne shooting, so I had to know who had assassinated him and why. Importantly, what was going to be the fallout of this event? It also helped as a first time GM to know where the plot would go so I wasn't trying to pull a mystery out of thin air. It also made game breaking plot holes less likely to happen. In total I would say maybe 20% of this final campaign was built out of this initial planning. Those big beats were in place but the in between wasn't set. Of that 20%, a large fraction ended up playing out live while the rest was cut either to keep pace or because it was just no longer viable. What then was that other 80%? One of the big pieces of advice for GMs of PBTA games, especially Dungeon Ward, is ask questions, use answers. Initially, you might not know exactly what that means. Should the entire fiction be governed by the players or merely the moment to moment events? The first milestone of the first game was finding my answer. Early on, the character of Kane Colt had decided that he wanted a gun to protect himself. Unlike other characters in the game, he didn't initially start with one. Instead of sending him to a gun store, he decided to ask an informant character where he could find one. He was pointing towards a weapons dealer operating out of an apartment. He discovered through flavour detail that these guns were military surplus. Being a Vietnam soldier, he was immediately suspicious about how these guns were procured. He decided to knock out the dealer and tip off the GCPD regarding the guns, making a note to start investigating the mystery next game. This created a situation I hadn't immediately intended for, nor could easily resolve during live play. After the first game, I knew it would be very difficult to quickly account for player actions in the middle of games on a macro scale like that. So instead, I took a smarter approach. I had the fortune of every game being recorded and uploaded a few hours after each live game completed, as well as writing up immediate notes in between. In the downtime between games, I could listen back and make more notes. From these notes, I could devise exactly what happened next. In the case of these stolen guns, we found out that they were being sold by a caution villain named General Mayhem. The payoff of this investigation was not only getting weapons off the streets, but giving the veteran a tease of the big question, who ordered the shooting of Bruce Wayne? It was General Mayhem's financier, the leader of the League of Shadows. These stolen guns also managed to come back to haunt them in following games. They became an integral part of the fiction, and it had come out of a request I couldn't have anticipated. This is why 80% of this campaign came out of post-game one play. Every big action they made needed a fit and reaction. From the halfway point of the campaign, the entire game was generated from their own actions. I asked questions, or in this case, put them in interesting situations that could go in lots of different directions, and their answers sent them hurtling down paths both expected and not. Sometimes being too beholden to planning can be an issue. During feedback, I asked if there was anything the players felt could have been a little better developed. This was in contrast to things they liked which will inform lessons learned. Interestingly, what they felt could have been a little better developed were NPCs. In this case, they wanted more of the characters they liked. They also mentioned one-offs that turned up to no real fanfare didn't really feel entirely satisfying. Their favourite of these characters was the Scarecrow. In our fiction of 77, he wasn't a maniacal edgelord. Rather, he developed out of this funny impression I did of Huey Emmerich from The Phantom Pain. The Scarecrow here believed himself wrongfully imprisoned, tarnished by the media as a caution criminal when in reality he was just a misunderstood genius. He appeared a few times in the campaign, usually coercing Frank Gibbs to do things for him. He'd appear at his bedside, always panicked and very shrill. He'd say things like, oh, Frank, you gotta help me, you gotta prove I'm innocent. But because of how I planned the campaign, I couldn't get him in every game. He only really appeared about four times overall, and the last time he did he was killed by another player. Meanwhile, as I realised listening back, there were a few times that the Scarecrow was brought up by the players because they just wanted to see more of him. On the flip side, there was a lot of late game big reveals like Jason Todd, Tim Drake and even Damian Wayne who were posed as threats but didn't really do much outside of the scenes they appeared in. This was versus mainstays like Barbara Gordon, Alfred Pennyworth and Theo Grant, who appeared almost every other session. This was a point where the plot had gone in the way of the planning. It was forcing the players into situations they didn't really want. It was me putting things in the pot because I wanted them, when really what I should have been doing was serving the fiction for the players. 
What was the lesson learned? Well, plan, but don't plot. Have a vague idea in place, have a few hooks for them to investigate, but don't force them down any one path. Things can really sing when players come up with solutions you didn't intend. And sometimes really interesting things can come out of the unexpected. Also, don't be afraid to rework those plans as you go along. You'd be surprised how useful that could be. As a player, I like when a GM can take details of my character and turn them into an obstacle. My favourite moment of an old campaign was when my werewolf pirate captain had to reveal that actually he was a themed entertainer and maybe not a werewolf in order to prove his innocence to a pirate landlord who had accused my character of murdering his son at sea. Not every player is going to like this, but I think you should consider it anyways. Ask them something about their character which they think could be an issue, and when appropriate, put them in a situation that will trip them up. Think of this as building around the characters further. Even better, pay attention to their actions that they perform in game. The loudest often echo the furthest. Better yet, take something that they have mm, some control over, and then turn that against them. During Game Zero, I asked each player to come up with some extra details about the world. This included characters that would help them out. For Theodore Holmes, he had a Watson, Barnaby Sutton, his friend from university. For Kane Colt, he had a Vietnam combat medic called uh, Clark Mayhew. But the most important ended up belonging to the uh, police officer Frank Gibbs, even if he didn't initially expect that. Murphy O'Hara is a character that exists because Frank's player wanted a stereotypical cop buddy. I decided to make him an Irish Chief O'Hara pastiche. From Game 2, I knew that he would betray the Gotham Knights on behalf of the Parliament of Owls. In Game 3, I gave them a tip-off that he knew more than he was letting on. And in Game 4, I knew exactly how he'd do them in. However, the original villain of this campaign changed after Game 5. Originally, it was going to be the League of Shadows. However, it didn't make a lot of sense that this intended second party would be the ones wanting a war with Gotham nor Bruce Wayne. Plus, as a final villain, it didn't feel particularly satisfying. So instead, I put Murphy at the center of this entire thing. This was important for me because it made the campaign a lot more personal to the players. No longer were they going to go up against a big Batman villain with the intent of them being impressed because it was a name they recognised. Instead, they'd be facing a character that they would grow to know over the course of the adventure. I even figured out how Murphy would do it too. He'd destroy the Parliament of Owls by turning attention on them for the shooting of Wayne. He would find a way to bring the entire might of the League of Shadows down on them. But I didn't really know why he wanted to do this until Game 9. Lewis Jenkins is a character that exists because Theodore Holmes died in Metropolis, and that changed plans for Episode 5. Originally, uh, Holmes's friend Barnaby would be put in a danger, and it would be up to the Knights to save him. However, with Theodore dead and the new team's ambivalence to the character, a new figure needed to be created to fill his place. And that's why Lou came in in Game 8. He was an obsessive Batman fanboy who had gone to the effort of making his own costume and gadgets. He stalked the Gotham Knights to survey them, knowing that they were working on the Wayne case. He even kept a diary that I was secretly updated in the background. And then he would be cornered by Kane and Lay. The Vietnam veteran didn't like him, but the new guy did. And the idea was that in order for episode 5 to kind of go as I had wanted it to, we needed a character to be put in peril to try and get the knights to act. After that game, Lay's player asked me if he could have Lou as a sidekick, and I realised that my plan worked. I also realised that we could tie this thing in a nice big bow. Lou would be put in danger, and that would turn Murphy against the knights, for a very simple reason. Secretly, Lewis was the son of Murphy. I laid some sort of clues for this revelation. When Frank met Lou for the first time on the adventure, I mentioned that he had a familiar look to him. Murphy also grilled Lay over him having any involvement with the Knight's investigation. And outside of the game, while well, I made sure that the character portraits were designed to be compliments to one another. In Game 12, they would find out the truth about both Murphy and Lou. 
The latter was the former's illegitimate son, put up for adoption to keep him out of the Parliament of Isles. To ensure his safety, Murphy would go to war with the organisation, using Wayne's assassination as the spark and leveraging the might of the League of Shadows against them with phony business cards and stolen Mafia money. Ultimately, thanks to the players, Murphy was successful as a villain. Due to Batman breaking into the meeting of the Parliament of Owls that night and taking out much of their rank. Unfortunately, it was at the cost of turning Gotham into a battleground that then reverberated into the final episode. But he'd have no chance to celebrate. You see, because of the events of the previous game, he was tortured and left for dead by the Owls, but was ultimately saved by his best friend Frank. In game 10, what was meant for Barnaby instead happened to Lou, and he had changed in a pretty serious way. And then he was put into a situation where Murphy would need a blood transfusion from him to survive, and that would change him too. Around the time that Detective Barbara Gordon explained to the Gotham Knights that Murphy was at the centre of the conspiracy, they had inadvertently created the villain of this campaign. I would hit the characters with some hard truths. For Frank Gibbs, it was the revelation that a character that had been designed to be his best friend had always been actively working against him. In the fiction, the Parliament of Owls had forced Murphy to be Frank's guardian and cover his incompetence for the purpose of folding him into his organisation, and this had been going on for decades. And well, it made sense because the way that Frank was played as a character was as this bumbling fool that it was questionable how he had any legendary status on the force whatsoever, so that neatly folded into that. Because of them, and Frank, Murphy genuinely hated this character more than anything. And well, with the owls no longer breathing down his neck when Batman took him out and then hooked up on this weird blood, well, he was going to cut loose. Frank, he hasn't been entirely honest with you, has he, Frank? What do you mean? I mean, yeah, you you lied to me several years. You f my wife. Oh, I f your wife, all right. I f every single one of your wives, Frank. <laughs> no, you didn't. Oh, I did. Now I'll tell you one thing about it. They f loved it more than they had any fun with you. You see, the golden rule of these games is that you should be a fan of these characters. And it makes sense. After all, no one wants to be in a world where the creator is actively working against the characters. However, you should keep any gripes to the villains. And, well, this was a perfect opportunity to do so. For Leifu, it was a more natural hard truth, in that his character had been predestined to be an ex-con who had changed his ways on the inside. But the exact details of why he went away was not in the player's hands, he left that to me. And so I laminated that across the story. He slit the throat of a new officer who was a secret owl's ploy, and the person who got lay off the hook was Murphy. At first this was because it helped keep the owls off his back. But in the final game, it was returning a favour to Lay's father. For King Colt, his hard truth was the revelation that he had been a pawn. From game 2, he'd been getting away with murder. In game 12, he found out why. Because the way that the player had gone about stuff, he had always intended from the beginning to be the Punisher in this Batman setting. He was going to kill bad guys, including much of Batman's rose gallery. But in this kind of slightly grounded setting that we had gone for, and the fact that they were working with members of the Bat family, it didn't make any sense that he could have done that and not got away with complete punishment. Well, an answer was nicely built in. Because this wasn't a sophisticated serial killer. Rather, he had only got away with murder because he had been granted immunity from the chief of police, Murphy O'Hara. The reason? To stoke this war, and to tie up some loose ends. For the reaction I got out of the player, it is one of my favourite moments of this campaign. It also led to maybe what was the most shocking moment of this campaign, because when they finally confronted each other, Kane decided to let Murphy go at the end of game 14. Kane actually takes the rifle off of like off of him, like slings it back over and starts walk what? What are and you just doing? starts walking away. Wow! On feedback, Murphy was a positively received element of the campaign. In my evaluation, I asked two questions. 
if James were to GM again, what advice would you give to him? Uh, the answer to this was useful. Pay attention to the player's moves and challenge their silly decisions. But the second question, was there anything James did as a GM that you might try yourself? Murphy was the answer that I got from the far more experienced Dungeon World GM in the game. And he came out of a character designed for a joke and another designed for convenience. So what was the lesson learned? Well, don't be afraid to ask players for rope to hang them with. They might even appreciate it as long as you give them the slack to escape. Importantly, if you can change the plot between games to improve the story, then by all means do so. Look for things that happened in previous games and build into the mythology. Importantly, always put the players right into the center of this story. This is their adventure at the end of the day. In total, 46 on-screen characters were killed by one man, Kane Colt. In that number, six were part of Batman's rogues gallery. The Penguin, Carmine Falcone, Bane, the Ventriloquist, Clayface, and the Scarecrow. He crippled Deadshot. He beat Batman. Almost twice. However, he let the Riddler go and the real villain of this campaign. He thought he killed Maximum Zeus, but he didn't. He also didn't kill Mr. Freeze, kill him off, nor Raish al Ghul. One player became Batman, Lei Fu. Another dressed up like Batman, Frank Gibbs. Frank Gibbs freed the Scarecrow from Arkham Asylum for personal gain. Later, he was coerced into clearing his name from the paper. Frank later attempted to save the Scarecrow's life from King Cole. He refused a man from seeing his friend and co-worker before he died. He bludgeoned an old man in the back of the head to try and steal his uniform. He condemned his best friend to a life of hell. Though, granted, I guess he was the real villain of this campaign. He then attempted to shoot and kill his son and Lay's sidekick, Lou. And then he lost his left leg, his right hand, and much of his legendary status on the force by the Avengers' end. Although he also got a movie deal out of it. Frank was a strange character. He had been there the night that Thomas and Martha Wayne were shot. He was there when Richard Grayson's family were killed by Tony Sato. He failed to stop Harvey Dent from being splashed in acid. He had been widowed six times, all from bizarre and upsetting circumstances. These were all details the player had written in from Game Zero. One of them, however, turned out to still be alive and was the mastermind of the Wayne shooting for the Owls. This detail I had planned in secret from, well, Session Zero. She was later killed by the real villain, and that detail was planned from Game 12. Two Spotify playlists were made. One was to set the mood for the campaign. Another of every band, song, or music reference that appeared in the adventure. For the last hit, there were 33 songs. In terms of originality, 62% of important characters that they met during the campaign had already existed in Batman or DC Mythos in some fashion. And this included not just the comics, but also film and animated adaptations. In most cases, they were tweaked for 77 in subtle ways, such as Barbara Gordon being a detective and not wheelchair bound, or Dick Grayson becoming a John Blake who was working against them. But some were given way more radical reinterpretations that made them totally unique. 33% of important characters were completely original, and this included their sidekicks. They might have been new costume villains like uh, General Mayhem, or might have just been members of the supporting cast. 5% of the cast were real people from 1970s pop culture. David Bowie, Donald Trump, Rudy Ray Moore, and Kermit the Frog appeared in the campaign with me doing very not good impressions of them. Many other musicians and celebrities of the era were also mentioned in passing. This sounds simple in practice, and it was when I figured it out. You see, Ken Colt, Theodore Holmes, and to an extent Lei Fu were a perfect fit for the campaign. They were ground-level characters whose abilities were suited well for investigation, close quarters, combat, and puzzle solving. And their motivation aligned with the spirit of the adventure also. They wanted to improve Gotham City in Batman's absence. But they went very different ways about achieving that. The odd fit was Frank Gibbs. 
He was an ex-police lieutenant who had been fired from the force for a bizarre accident. In fact, Frank had been at the centre of almost all trauma in Gotham City and was something of a tragic figure himself. However, his playbook was the good old boy, and in the fiction of Spirit of 77, this is the car class. They're at their best behind the wheel and solve almost all their problems with two tons of destroyed steel. However, car combat or even car travel wasn't really considered for the campaign, apart from its bookends. It meant that as he levelled up, many of his new special moves had no real application to the situations he was put in. In this case, I was playing more to the narrative of the character than the mechanics of him. So my lesson learned was to actually consider not just who the characters were, but what they could do. In Kane and Lay's case, it meant I could also intentionally do what I accidentally did to Frank and put them in situations that would test them outside of their comfort zones. Kane often found himself having to talk his way out of problems, whilst Lay went up against physical challenges. Speaking of... Here's a sad truth about fighting in tabletop role-playing games. It's really boring. Something that is exciting to watch happen in movies is very poorly recreated in a dice-driven narrative game. But the problem isn't so much the content as it is the context. Think about this situation. You're in a bar that's suddenly attacked by orcs. You draw your sword and begin to hack and slash. What motivated you to do this? Was it out of personal interest, or were you trying to protect someone else? If the answer is the former, it's likely you're not entirely engaged in the fights. But for the latter, you suddenly have stakes. There's someone here you need to keep alive. But is sticking around really the best answer in this situation? Maybe you need to fight forward to push them towards a goal. Or maybe you're just trying to hold these enemies long enough so for this person to cast a spell or, you know, do something else. Maybe you need to wear these enemies down to interrogate them and ask them why they are attacking this person. You know, this is a VIP that you need to protect. I mean, maybe it's not a person, maybe it's bags of treasure that you need to keep filled up. Suddenly, you have a combat scenario that is rich with potential, because you're not just fighting for fight's sake. So when did I figure this out? Well, some of my favourite moments of this campaign came out of these strange combat situations and how the players dealt with them. In game 4, King Colt was placed in the back of a limousine with no weapons to his hand and four enormous mobsters with pistols around him. So he picked up a riot helmet as his weapon and used those bodies to protect himself. In game 6, the Gotham Knights were trapped in a hotel room with a sniper on the opposite roof. With no way to fight back, it was a death trap that they needed to escape out of. In Game 10, Lay and Kane found themselves in the home of Killer Moth and his family. The latter had stolen a pet animal that had belonged to the group for his young daughter, and wouldn't be returning it without a fight. However, he didn't use a traditional firearm, instead it was a glue gun. Lay's objective was to try and find the dog in this chaos, while Kane was to slow them down to interrogate them and the glue guns put them in situations where they were either stuck or on the spot and some of their limbs had been disabled momentarily. Having an entire family to fight, including an unhinged small child, ended up making things way more interesting, especially when said child was taken hostage for leverage. The lesson learned is to do this more often. You know, not every encounter can have strange guns or tense situations but each can be made way more exciting with an added objective to it. One of the pieces of advice that I got from my old game master during the feedback session was this. When a character is about to do something stupid that'll put their character in serious danger, ask why. This is tricky because often asking a player why are you doing that can reveal your hand too much. It clues players in that this isn't the right answer, or that there actually is a right answer to the solution. So what should you do to stop players from killing their characters? Well, maybe instead of asking them if they think that's the best course of action, ask them where their head's at. Often, poor decision making comes out of just not having the full mental picture. For example, let's go back to game 13, that moment that split the party further on the Riddler's train of terror. King Colt pulled out a gun to shoot Maxi Zeus, and Lei Fu wanted to stop him. In this tense moment, we asked Frank Gibbs what he wanted to do. Yeah, no, Frank is also gonna smoke his ass. 
<laughs> Wait, <laughs> you're gonna come out of this as well? <laughs> The game collapsed momentarily as we all couldn't quite believe what he had said. However, he was adamant on this plan, so they made their roles. It was only until Kane's player asked if they knew what was happening that this guy said... Oh no! Oh, yeah. oh are you shooting me? Wait, or did you what the f*** is?! <laughs> Moral of the story was... Make sure... That players know exactly what they're doing before they do it. Often easier said than done, but do that for your own games and well it will make situations like that less likely to occur. This might be the most important lesson learned. It might be a little hack to say that the one rule is there is no rules, but it's applicable here. The Spirit of 77 book was quite hard to follow at times. On an 8 point health scale, there was no real delineation on whether a character died on 6, 7 or 8 harm. In the book's own words, at 6 harm you'll die at the end of the scene, or 7 harm you die, at 8 harm you die explosively. This is, unfortunately, the reason why Holmes died in Metropolis. Granted, I decided to bring back a mechanic that I love from Dungeon World, at the Black Gates. You see, when a character dies in Dungeon World, they all meet the Reaper and have to roll for their life. My first character unfortunately rolled poorly and was taken away. However, another character rolled a mixed success. They were given a choice. If they wanted to come back, they would have to give up something of their past life. In this case, he would have to change classes from being a con man. He would have to become an honest man. He happily took that bargain. I made a similar offer to Theodore Holmes when he died. He could come back, but there was a complication. Perhaps his character would be paralysed from the waist down, perhaps he would lose his detective prowess and have to change classes. Shockingly, he refused. For his troubles, Holmes would be memorialised in a cartoon made by Barnaby and his girlfriend, where Theo was an anthropomorphic dog who solved crimes. Often the most fun that we got out of the campaign was when the book wasn't in the way. It was letting the players ask whatever questions they wanted about a crime scene, not just the ones prescribed by the move. It was giving them something extra roles, even when they didn't trigger their use. Pacing and play came before hard rules in almost all cases. Granted, you can't run an entire campaign without rules. Though maybe you can. Someone a lot smarter than me probably could. Funnily enough, I am in the midst of playing a Spirit of 77 game with my old GM. As a player, instead of the world author, I actually understand a lot of what the book can and can't do now. During the feedback, they said that upgrading their characters in the Spirit of 77 wasn't very interesting. As a player, I now understand that they were absolutely right. If I did a sequel, I'd probably look at giving them options that aren't in the book, and that could make things far more exciting. I also realise how broken a lot of moves in this game are. So in this new campaign, I'm playing the Vigilante class, who, whenever they use their gun to solve a problem, can roll with something extra. Something extra is when you roll with three dice instead of two, and you drop the lowest one. That combined with a plus two stat boost is utterly disgusting, but it's pretty fun to be on the player's side of using those moves. Lesson learned, if it doesn't really work for what you want, don't worry about it. A book is a guideline not a hard rule set to follow. From September 28th 2019 until February 10th 2020, I ran an almost weekly tabletop campaign for three other people. It was my first time being Game Master. In total, the adventure lasted 52 hours and 25 minutes, split over 17 individual games. At the end of the campaign, I asked a series of questions to the players to evaluate the success of the game, my GM skills and their satisfaction. Overall, they were positive on all three. I asked if they would be interested to do another game in this setting. They said yes. Importantly, they wanted it to be completely new, with very little tying it back to the old game. I then asked a few final questions, just to test their interpretation of events. Who shot Bruce Wayne and why? Who sparked the war in Gotham, and why? What happens next? There was no correct answer to any of these, and that was intentional. That open-ended interpretation, as well as the reverb of these previous events, is what's going to seed the next adventure. When that happens, 
Right now, I might want to try a fantasy campaign. Maybe a different system entirely. Maybe make my own. Now that I've been a full-time GM, I really want to do it again. I've learnt a lot, and hopefully by listening to all this, you can avoid the mistakes I did, or try the things that went successfully for me. In September 2019, I was a small green baby with an eye patch. In 2020, I am a very real, very tired man. But with this campaign behind me, maybe it's time to relax. Until the next video, at least.